I'm George. George McFly. I'm your density. Density. Neutral density filters. That's what we're talking about today. The ND filter for your camera, why you need it, what it does, how it works, and uh, basically, yeah, this is one of those things you're going to want to have. Good morning and welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment, the first live three times a week show here at youtube.com slash photo joseph every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9.30 a.m. Pacific, talking about all sorts of things, photography, video, live streaming related. And hey, on the timing, it's usually 9.30, but every once in a while we do an afternoon show just to try and get people on the other side of the world. So if you are watching this not live and you're thinking, man, I wish I could watch a live show every once in a while, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell because then you will get notified when we go live and it's in your time zone so you can actually check it out. So today we're talking about neutral density filters. What is an ND filter? So you see the word ND, ND stands for neutral density. You also see variable ND, and a variable ND is a, a neutral density filter that changes. It's quite exciting. So at its core, a neutral density filter, it reduces the amount of light, it restricts the amount of light coming into the camera. It's neutral, the neutral part of it is neutral, meaning it's not adding any color cast to it. Ideally. Now, I will say that lesser inferior filters will tend to add a color cast, usually a little bit towards blue or a little bit towards brown. I've even seen them go towards green before. It's kind of awful. This is a kind of color correction that, in a pinch, it's probably okay. You can probably correct around it, especially if you do a custom white balance and then maybe do a little correction in post. But in general, you want to get your filters as neutral as possible. Neutral density filters can be quite expensive. They can be well over $100. Some of the bigger names like B&W make really, really, really good filters, but they're pretty spendy. The cool thing is that I've been working with some much lower cost filters, and I've had zero problems with them. I'm not going to say they're as good. I'm not going to say there's no color cast, but I have not seen any issues with any of the cheaper filters that I've been using lately, including ones from, let's see, this one is a Fotga, F-O-T-G-A, Fotga, and this one I think is another brand, maybe just the same. This one, oh, this is also a Fotga, there you go. So two thumbs up to the Fotgas. We're gonna link to these filters down below, but, um, but they've been really good to me. So let's go back to the basics. What is it? A neutral density filter restricts the amount of light coming through the lens reaching the sensor. Why does this matter? All right, back up in a little, uh, little photo 101 here. So when you think about the exposure, the exposure is assembled of a trinity. You have three things that go into making your exposure. You have your ISO, you have your shutter speed, and you have your aperture. Any one of those can be controlled and adjusted to get the exposure that you need, an ideal exposure, correct exposure. So let's start with the ISO. ISO is generally one that we pretty much always want to keep as low as possible. Right? We all know that the higher your ISO, the noisier or grainier the picture is going to be. So in general, we want our ISO to be as low as possible. If we're shooting outdoors in the full sun, this is an easy one. You're going to put the camera as low as it goes, or at least um, as low as is optimal, and you're going to be good to go. So this one is pretty easy. For outdoor shooting in the bright sun, you're going to keep it down. And incidentally, outdoor shooting in the bright sun is the kind of place where you're going to use one of these restricting the amount of light coming in. It's not really something you use indoors in a low light situation because you already don't have enough light. Okay, so the ISO part of the equation, this is easy. We keep it as low as possible. That's done. That's easy. All right, so then that leaves shutter speed and aperture. The shutter speed, we'll start with that. When you're shooting still photography, you can choose a shutter speed from, well, as low as you want, you know, literally multiple seconds up to as fast as your camera will do. Many cameras do four thousandths of a second, eight thousandths of a second, twelve thousandths of a second, like ridiculously high numbers. And when you're shooting still photography, if you're doing something like a portrait or, I don't know, taking a picture of a scenic, it doesn't really matter too much. It's, if, as long as things aren't moving in the scene, it doesn't really matter. So the difference between, say, a shot at 250th of a second versus one at 2,000th of a second, for the vast majority of type of photography, it really doesn't matter. If you're shooting sports, fast action, obviously you want that really fast shutter speed to freeze the action, great. If you want to have a little bit of motion blur, you gotta have a little bit slower shot, fine. But for the most part, if you're shooting at 250th, a 500th, a thousandth, a two thousandth, yeah, for most pictures, it's pretty much the same. So now let's move to aperture. Aperture becomes a very creative decision for still photography. Your aperture can be really big. It could be like an f1.2 if you got a lens that fast, or an f2.8 or an f4 is going to be more common, down to something small like a f11, f16, f22. The smaller that aperture gets, the less light is coming through. So this is how you can restrict light coming into the scene. But as we all know, the side effect of this is the more we stop it down, the shallower uh, the, the larger the depth of field, the bigger, the wider open it is, the shallower depth of field, meaning how much is in 
focus. If we want to take a portrait photo, you want to have a picture of a person, you probably want the background to be relatively out of focus. That requires a larger aperture. So that large aperture to get that shallow depth of field is letting a lot of light in, which for still photography is going to mean needing a faster shutter speed. OK, so that's fine. So for still photography, in a full sunny day, we open it wide up. We get that shallow depth of field. We go to a 2,000th, 4,000th, 8,000th of a second. We get the exposure that we need, and boom, you're happy, you're good. But now let's switch over to video. When you're shooting video, you don't have the same control over your shutter speed. Now, I shouldn't say that you don't have it. You can do it. You can take your shutter speed really, really high, but what happens is you end up with a video stream, a video feed, that doesn't look quite right. It has this very staccato look to it. We've actually talked about this before when we talked about shutter angle versus shutter speed. We'll link to that video up here. We had a whole discussion about it, and I showed some examples of high shutter speed or shutter angle versus kind of normal shutter speed or shutter angle for video. In general, in general, this is not a hard, fast rule, but this is kind of the baseline that to which we all, uh, we all start with. In general, you want your shutter speed for video, just forget shutter angle for a moment, you want your shutter speed for video to be half of the frame rate. So if you're shooting at 30 frames per second, which is pretty normal, in North America, 30 frames per second is normal, in Europe, 25 frames per second is normal, you want a shutter speed that is 60th of a second or 50th of a second. So let's just stick with NTSC, 30 frames per second video, you want a 60th of a second shutter speed. That's generally what we want. Okay. So if I shoot wide open at f1.228 or something, my shutter speed for a still has to be four thousandths of a second. Well, that's nowhere near that 60th of a second. And if I want to shoot at that ideal 60th of a second, there's no way that I can shoot wide open at f2.8 or whatever it might be. It's way too much light. So now I have to restrict the amount of light coming into the lens. If I want to shoot wide open when shooting video, I need to shoot with a neutral density filter, something that will restrict the amount of light coming through the lens. Back to still photography, a place where it becomes very handy is if you want to do a long exposure. Let's say you're shooting something like a waterfall. So here's a couple of very simple, not very exciting, but simple little photos of waterfalls, rushing rivers. We have the beautiful motion blur of the water. That is because I was able to shoot at a long exposure. It might have been a 30th or a 15th or a multiple, you know, one second, two seconds, whatever. Long exposures. Going back to that full daylight or even in the shade like these photos were, you're one of shooting at that low ISO. That's going to be your advantage anyway. Um, you're probably not going to want to restrict the aperture too much, but you know you could a little bit. You're not trying to go for that super shallow depth of field. We maybe bring it down to like 5.6, f8 or something, and now you're shooting at a shutter speed of let's say 250th of a second. Well, that's pretty much going to freeze the water. If you want to have that 30th, that quarter of a second, that one second, two second, five second exposure, you need to reduce the amount of light in. So again, neutral density. So those are two very common uses of neutral density. On still photography, to force a long exposure so that you can have a, the, the rushing water type of a thing, that movement that you want in there. And on video, it's so that you can keep a shutter speed or shutter angle, if you're shooting shutter angle, that is optimum. So you have that shutter angle of 180 degrees or the shutter speed, if you're shooting in 30p, of a 60th of a second. This allows you that control. So the trifecta of exposures may not get you to where you want to be when you want to be on that lower end of shutter speed when you're out in full sun. So that's where these things come into play. OK, so when you go to buy these things, there's two different ways you can buy them. You can buy a single ND filter that is a specific stop. It is a one-stop ND, a two-stop ND, a four-stop ND. This is reducing that much light in stops, measured in stops, from what's coming into the camera. And remember, a stop, every stop is either doubling or half of the amount of light, depending on which way you're going. So that's great, but they're not very flexible. Now, for still photography, that's, they're probably fine, especially if you're doing something like a waterfall, because you, if you've got a bag of these things, you can go, OK, let's try the two stop, look at, mm, not quite the right, take it off, but the four stop on, there we go, there's the exposure that I want, cool. But when you're shooting video, you, you can't be doing that. When you're shooting video, you need to be a bit more flexible. And even shooting stills, it's obviously convenient to be flexible. And the flexibility comes in something called a variable ND. Now, variable ND generally goes from like two to six or two to eight stops. Um, this one doesn't say on it. Of course, it doesn't. But I think it was two to six or two to eight. We'll link to these down below. I want to say two to eight on these. They're pretty good. And it's like a polarizing filter. You just turn it to change the amount of light coming through. So how does that work? Well, on a very, very simplified level, it is two pieces of glass. Imagine, if you will, and this is obviously not exactly how it works, but it's basically, imagine, if you will, you were looking through two screens. You had two screens, not not hash screens, but two just vertical line screens, two of them like this. When they held up like this, lined up with each other, the most light's going to come through. 
as I start to rotate these, it's restricting the light. The holes are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, allowing less and less light through. That's effectively what's happening. It's just on a light wavelength level. So by rotating them against each other, you're restricting the amount of light comes through. This is why when you get to a bigger one like these, you, with a really wide range, you can imagine, if you think of it like those holes, those holes are going to get really small. And by the time they align up perfectly, the holes might be almost too small. And what you'll often find, and I do find on these, is if you go too close to, to the max, and usually once you hit max, or maybe even a little bit before that, certainly if you go after, once those things line up completely, you actually don't get anything coming through. It's just basically completely dark. That is also where you're likely to see distortion, some weird coloring happening. You'll see it as soon as you look through a, fil a camera with a filter on and you start rotating it down, it'll very quickly go from darker, 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 bleh, that just suddenly goes to heck. So that's just one of those things that happens on these filters that do that really wide range. So that's everything you need to do. We're going to go outside in a moment. Before I do that, I want to remind you of the way that we operate here on the show. We operate in something called a value for value proposition. What that means is if you feel like you have taken value from today's show, then we would most certainly appreciate if you could put a little bit of value back in. Head over to photojoseph.com slash support and you can see all the different ways to provide value there. We have membership on the website photojoseph.com, which includes, by the way, the business of the business interviews. The second one is finally getting uploaded today. Had some issues with the audio editing on that, but that's done. Third interview has been shot and I will be editing that over the next few days or week or so and we'll get that online ASAP. So photojoseph.com slash support. And remember, if you do decide to buy these filters, I would most certainly appreciate it if you use the affiliate links that are down below, or you can get to them from that support page as well. All right, with that said, let's go outside. Ryan, coming out, let's go outside and uh, let's do ourselves a live demo, shall we? I'm going to need the ND filter. And oh, don't forget to talk about these when I get back. And I guess that's it. Let's do this. All righty. Greetings, everybody. We are outside and the big fans are going. Hopefully, it's not too loud for you. And um, let's just take a look through the camera and see what I've got here. So, currently set up, let's see, let me focus on Ryan. We are shooting, I'm shooting with the Noctocron lens. I'm at f1.2, ISO 400. Let's start with that. So I'm going to make sure my ISO is low at 400. Good. And I'm shooting at f1.2, but look at the shutter speed. 16, 16 thousandths of a second. That's really, really fast. So that's not going to work too well for video, is it? Now, with this combination, let me go back in here. If I stop this down, say I take it down to like uh, f9, we're at 1600, uh, 1600 of a second. Let's keep going down, F16, 500 of a second. So we're getting a lot more depth of field. Let's get, there we go, there's our depth of field preview. You're getting a lot more depth of field in there. Definitely not good. If I bring this back up to one, two, I get that nice shallow bokeh on there. You can see where the, uh, the shutter speed is. So that is, that's where we're at right now. So um, that's, you know, fine for still photography of a portrait, Obviously, it's not going to get me what I want if I'm shooting a waterfall, but not any good for video. So let me switch this over to video mode, and we're going to see where we run into a wall and we simply cannot get the exposure right for video. All right, I'm going to actually start at an ideal shutter angle of 180 degree, and let's see if I can even get the exposure right. So I'm stopping this all the way down to F16. So at ISO 400, I can even take it down to 200. So 200, 180 degree shutter, F16, still overexposed. Let me take the shutter angle down a little bit more, it's about 90 degree shutter. So there, I can finally get the exposure, but it's not right, that's not what I want, right? I've got that, all that depth of field, see all the crud in the background, definitely not what I want. So if I go back to trying to shoot this thing at an f1.2 aperture, well, clearly it's way overexposed, and obviously if I bring my shutter angle to 180 degrees, we're completely, totally blown out. So. That's not going to work. So now we need the variable ND. So let's see if I can do this without actually dropping it like I almost did earlier today. Super, there we go. I'm going to start this thing at the minimum setting. So find my dot, there it is, set that to the minimum setting. And let's take a look through here and see what we've got. So at the minimum setting, we are still really, really overexposed. But as I start to dial it down, now notice the camera settings are not changing. We're still at F12, still at 180 degree, still at ISO 200. But now I can bring it down and get the exposure right, and there we go. So now I've got my wide open shot with the Noctocron in full daylight while shooting video. That's pretty cool. That is what the ND filter does for us when shooting video. It allows us to shoot with whatever aperture we want at the proper shutter angle or shutter speed at a reasonable ISO 
and get the shot that we want. All right, let's head back inside. All righty, so what do you guys think? Pretty cool, right? It's really interesting to see that thing working live like that. I know I could have just shown you a bunch of pre-shot videos, but I thought I'm going to show it to you in real time. I think it'll be a bit more effective. So hopefully that was clear. All right, so the last thing that I want to mention to you when you're going to buy these is it's easy to look at these and go, well, even the cheap ones, you know, they might end up being you know, a little bit expensive if I realize that I have a bunch of different lenses with a bunch of different filter sizes on them. Well, here's the way you get around that. You buy one for the biggest lens that you have. And the only reason that I have two here is because the one out there that I just put onto the Noctocron was the biggest lens that I had, and then I decided I needed one for another lens that was actually bigger, so I had to buy another one. But you buy one, and then you buy step-down rings. So this is a series of step-down rings. This stack, while it looks a little bit, um, maybe a little bit silly here, it's going this a little bit silly, this huge stack of rings in here. This stack of rings, you can see each one of these goes from, like the, that second one goes from 52 to 55, and that's going to go from 55, let's see, where is it? Let's throw that around there somewhere. There we go, it goes 55 to 58, and then that's plugged into one that goes from 58 to 62, then 62 to 67, and so on and so on and so on. So you end up with a stack of these that you then put your, is this the right one? Yeah, there we go, that you can then put on there. So now you've got, there you go, right? Ta-da! The kind of cool thing about this is this also acts as a bit of a lens shade. I can't argue with that. A lens shade is always a good thing. And the reason this is notable is because once you put this filter on, even if you don't have any adapter rings, odds are you're not going to be able to use your lens shade. Your lens shade would screw into the camera or mount onto the front of the lens, rather, and that would block any filter that you put on there. So you need to be able to move this. It's kind of hard to do when there is a um, lens shade covering it. So just one of those things to consider as well. Um, remember, you're probably not going to be able to use your lens shade, but if you do something like this, then you kind of get a little bit of a built-in lens shade on there. Now, light could still hit this, hit the glass here, but um, it's better than it hitting the front lens, and it's probably not going to be a problem anyway. Anyway, so there you go. That, my friends, is that. So I hope that was interesting and edu formidal, educational and informal, something like that. Anyway, you know what to do. Subscribe, hit the bell, all that good stuff. We're going to jump into the Q&A if you're watching the show live. Participate in the Q&A. If you're not watching live, you can watch the Q&A later and uh, ask any questions you want in the comments. We will be right back.